How's it going, Mr. Porcupine? Welcome back, everybody. Just finishing up another work day on the field. Today's adventure was removing most of that first topsoil pile that used to be right here and getting it spread out along my drainage way that I created with the H and the tumble bug in one of the last videos. Um, used quite a bit of that pile too, that first one. But we have a little bit of topsoil spread out over all that barren sand. So they're talking maybe some rain tomorrow night. So depending on what the forecast looks like in the morning, um, I might come out here and seed this and hope that we get some rain on it uh, tomorrow night. Start to establish some root structure back in here. Keep it from washing out quite so bad. Luckily, I was able to scrounge some spare rocks and I made three small erosion dams. There's the second one. Third one right here to hopefully take the majority of what's going to come down that hill and maybe slow it down enough that it's not going to uh, wash too much material and deposit it down there. By the time it gets to this area down here, it's flat enough. I don't think it's going to have enough velocity to wash anything. And I still need to fill in a little bit more to join that to the grassy section over there. That's not going to happen today. I'm pretty much done, done raking uh, material for today. But I think there's still enough gas left in the tank to do an after hours in the shop video tonight. Stay tuned. All right, back home just finishing up the evening in the shop. Still have all of the nasty field grime all over me. I don't think my clientele will mind. Let's start with a mail call real quick, shall we? Um, we'll start with this uh, the Bucyrus Erie porcelain tag. Now my buddy Dan from Alaska sent me this. Um, it's a miniature version of that bigger one I have up there. And of all the porcelain I have on the walls in this place, honestly, these two Bucyrus Erie tags now, or signs, whatever you want to call them, are the only actual authentic vintage ones that I have. Everything else here is repops because I'm, I'm way too cheap to pay authentic porcelain sign prices. I'm not going to do it, but I like the high quality of them and I like the look of them. So that's that. And uh, something I noticed too, he even signed it on the back too. Six of 2020, <laughs> classic. He sent a little bit of a note along with this. Um, he took it off of, let's see here, an IHT9 tractor. It had a Bucyrus Siri blade on it. Let's get the camera pointed the right way. He says, uh, only history he knows of the T9. The engine block was cast in late November, 24th, I think. However, the old guys at Red Power said they would run castings and then warehouse them for a minimum of three months to cure before sending them out for milling, which would put the engine early 44. The casting date on IH in no way gives any information about the date of production. I think the T9 was most likely sold as parts by the military because the serial number plate had been removed in proper military manner with a cutting torch. So, interesting piece, uh, another wall hanger all the way from Alaska. That's the furthest away I've ever got one of those. I've been looking for some smaller things to go kind of in that small space up above that door. And I think this little Bucyrus Erie tag is going to fit there just fine. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Now, a few things I've recently picked up from the Antique Caterpillar Machinery Owners Club. They make these nice uh, vintage looking thermometers. It has the old diesel 60 on there. It comes with the Celsius as well as Fahrenheit scales. There is a Caterpillar dealer near you. Nice little item. I'll pop a link to the ACMOC site and store down below. Go check those guys out. We got a lot more cool stuff. They also uh, sell these Caterpillar 75 reprints from the old uh, Holt Manufacturing Company. Now these are aluminum. They come in a matte finish or like a gloss. I got the matte. That's another interesting piece. We'll find a home on the wall. Um, restoration supplies. I got another one of those exhaust extension pieces for the old 212 grader. The one that's on there is pretty well beat up, so I decided I'd pop for another one of those. And interesting uh, uh, deal that they sell. 
these are reproduction um, pressure gauge faces. This is an old style oil pressure gauge. Now they also do the fuel pressure gauge faces. Um, this is the style like is on 1113 right here. So the contents of the kit are instructions on how to replace that gauge face. If you have a good working gauge, you can buy these faces. You can see they are uh, basically brand new. They have the old Silfen uh, logo down there, the operating range lube oil pressure. We'll just compare it to this one. You can see if that gauge works, you can really refresh it with the new face. And uh, instruction sheet, sorry, the face. They have a couple new screws for holding the face onto the gauge and a couple of plastic sleeves for pressing the whole thing back together. Very handy items if you get into restoration of these things. As you can tell, I'm gonna be doing some gauge work for old 1113 shortly. Handy stuff to have, check them out finish up here quick uh shout out to my sister and brother-in-law they had this uh squatch 253 steel cut out custom made for me we got the sasquatch logo with the 253 i've had this for a couple months actually and i'd like to get some paint on it so that it's not just in the uh the bare metal finish before i hang it on the wall that's kind of the one thing that's been holding me up because you know i i love taking time to paint things now to answer some of the uh, questions that have been coming up quite often in the comment section lately. A um, lot of interest in my little Cat 10 from a few weeks ago when I had it out and about, kind of tearing up the yard. Um, and there's been a lot of people asking to see that, like pull the tumble bug or get out and work, uh, stuff like that. I don't run that thing very much because um, the cosmetic restoration that was done to it before I bought it um, was, uh, was a bit sloppy. and. Um, I've been into that tractor doing some other repairs and through the course of those repairs like uh, when I replace the fan belt and everything click on that little link that just popped up in the corner that'll take you to that video um, like between the pulley sheaves and in just about everything else I've been into on that little cat there's sandblasting grit mixed with old oil and grease literally in everything on that machine when I took those um, loosen those uh, pulley shivs up on that water pump and started turning them. It was like a grinding paste and everything. It was gritty. It was nasty. And after seeing things like that, I don't feel comfortable getting that thing out and really working it until I've been through that thing and made sure that there's no other grit, grinding paste in anything else. Because if I really put that thing to work and tried to run it for a full day, I could really cause some serious damage if there's a lot of that stuff still in there. So the trouble with the 10 is it just needs everything <laughs> before I can really get it out and really feel good about running it. So that's why that really never makes it out of the shed. Um, interesting uh, questions about that little tractor too. Um, one that comes up quite often, this was from uh, Russell Gnus. He asked, did the 10 have a blade on it when you got it? It looks like there was a bracket on the sides. Lots of questions about those brackets on the sides and it's kind of a long story. Um, I'll just show you what's up on the tractor. All right, recorded earlier of course, but I've ran the little 10 just far enough out of the cat shed to show you this piece right here. Now, I've had a lot of questions on that. People are asking, is that a footstep? What is going on? Well, I'll show you. The other side has the same angle style bracket and you can see they are connected to about a three inch diameter arched bar that goes all the way under the chassis of the cat and pivots along with these brackets. So the story of those brackets, although the snowplow blade that was on the 10 when I bought it was anchored to those brackets, That's not what those brackets were originally for. Um, the snowplow blade looks to me like it's kind of a worked over, pieced together unit. I believe they had an old V-plow snowplow back in the day that they cut in half, they turned it into a one-way blade for the uh, Cat 10, and then they just kind of built the arms and everything to go onto those existing brackets. Now, what were those brackets for with that long arched bar that goes beneath the chassis? We'll come over here to the old <coughs> Caterpillar and Equipment chart. So, back in the day, you could buy a Bearcat 10 for $1,100, brand new. And you come over here, we have the Caterpillar 10 Motor Patrol, and that's what my little 10 used to be. 
That big arched bar with those brackets is where the channel iron frame of the grater anchored and pivoted pretty much center line on the track frames. Um, that's honestly what that thing used to be. Now, where the rest of that grater attachment went, I don't know. And I should add, you could buy that whole grater attachment for just a mere $800 back in the day. Um, equipped with a 10-foot blade and canopy top. Curtains are extra. Or it can be equipped with an 8-foot or 12-foot blade. Uh, weight to the grater unit without tractor, 4,565 pounds. With scarifier, 5,365 pounds. Lighting, equipment available for night work. And you will remember my little Cat 10 had a generator on it at one time. I never put it back on after I had split the engine to do the clutch work because, again, that sandblasting grit I found in everything. Those generators are rare as hen's teeth, and I didn't want that thing sitting there and spinning with who knows what inside of it. So that's packed away safely, not on the 10. Um, more proof that my 10 used to be a motor patrol. You will note on the steering clutch levers, we have this old witness mark from a set screw here with a couple of other witness marks down there. And on the other steering clutch lever, another set screw witness mark with a couple of gouges down there. We also have curious holes drilled in each brake pedal with nowhere whatsoever on those pedals. They're like cheese graters yet. Those old witness marks on the steering clutch levers were from foot pedal attachments that that motor patrol kit had that would bolt onto the steering clutch levers and you could run each of those steering clutch levers with your foot instead of your hands because of all of the tiller wheels that were involved with running the jack screws and the blade and everything else with the greater attachment. It helped to free up the operator's hands. And there were also extension pieces off the brake pedals that got controls up into the uh, canopy area, the operator's platform, where he could have easier access to those brake pedals as well. Another interesting thing, so it says for use with Caterpillar 10 tractor, tractor must be equipped with rear starting crank, which is this apparatus right here. That allowed you to get to the back of the machine to crank it to start because, you know, with the blade and the greater attachment and everything, you weren't going to have easy access at that front crank to start it that way. But that's, uh, that's really kind of a neat little machine. Now, the odd part of it is the hand wheel lift for that one-way snowplow blade that they kind of made for it, it's a Wausau brand lift, so that part's legit. I just don't know how that one-way blade came to be and who decided they were going to piece it onto that old Motor Patrol pivot bracket. And man, I'd love to know where the greater attachment went for that little 10, but I'm pretty sure... It probably ended up being cut up, melted down, and remade into a Sherman tank around World War II sometime, which is cool too, but now I kind of want the tank too. Another thing you can see is not quite right. They have cut the lower edges of the hood off. They did this on both sides. The hood used to stick down about where this gap line is right here, and it would have hinged sections on it where louvered side panels would actually hinge up to give you access to the engine. Because of the snowplow lift assembly that stuck up right here around each track, they could not hinge those side panels up. So they cut the hood off short and they kind of made, these are the original old side panels they had, and they had a couple tracks set up so that you could slide these vertically up and down to close in the engine. So you guys should know by now that my OCD would never allow me to have those type of slide up and down non-authentic side panels on that cat. And yes, I do plan on putting the snowplow blade back on it after I've done full mechanical on a machine and it needs full cosmetic again too. That one's gonna get paint and everything. It's gotta be mechanically sound first and then we'll make it look nice. But to solve the side panel problem with that blade lift on that obstructs the hinge up louvers, well, I've got this. Um, Brand new set of reproduction louvered side panels for the Cat 10. Very talented guy in California makes these things. Excellent work. These things are just perfect, let me tell you. It's got all the beads rolled in there. The louvers are spaced properly. Good release for the exhaust pipe. Now, these are the hinge open style louvers that I got for my 10. The way I'm going to get around the access problem for that blade lift being in the way is 
he also made me a couple strips that are like hangers. Now the high clearance Cat 10s did not have hinge open panels. They had these hanger strips that were riveted down the side of the hood, um, one strip on each side. So the panels basically hung at the top on these strips. You could just take and uh, detach the hinges at the base and then lift the panel straight off of these strips because it's not a closed in hinge piece. So what I'm gonna do is just make a new hood. That's gonna be easy. These strips rivet down the side, just like a high clearance 10. I can then lift these panels straight off. They will not be coming out and hitting those uh, those blade lift brackets. And I'll have that little 10 really done upright and looking sharp. Um, I also got a full set of the reproduction spring-loaded hood hinge latches for these uh, for these side panels and all the hardware to install them. So. That's pretty much the full story on my 10. Um, that's kind of why I don't run it a lot, and gosh, it needs a lot of work. The only thing I haven't had is time to do it. I've had these panels, and I've had that 10 for years now, several years, and I'm still trying to get to it, but, you know, it's life. Another video that uh, had a lot of the same questions on was the uh, the latest one with the Farmall H and the tumble bug that I uploaded. Um, First one I'll get to, Jim, because I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Can I ask why you leave the drawbar free to swing? Well, Jim, and the several other people that also asked that question, it's best explained in the Caterpillar Selected Service Articles magazine. They have a nice little uh, cartoon-like article here titled, Unpin the Drawbar, from September 1st, 1932. So, let it swing. That was the sound and only necessary advice given by a serviceman to a farmer who had called saying his new caterpillar wouldn't turn properly when pulling on soft ground. Again, also applies to the Farmall H wheel tractor. There are three drawbar arrangements possible. Full swing, modified swing, and fixed, also like the H. The full swinging hookup allows the tractor to turn much easier and shorter because the load pivots freely from a point near the center of the tractor and gives a greater leverage on the outside track, or wheel in my case. This is a big factor in letting the tractor turn easily, get into corners, run on a shorter curve without the brake, and makes better all-around performance, especially on soft ground. And that is exactly why when I'm pulling that scraper, I let the drawbar swing because I started out pulling it uh, with it fixed in the center and it's fine if you only ever have to go in a straight line but a lot of those areas that I was working here this last weekend and really the whole time I was out there in the bowl I let that thing swing because I ended up cutting in a lot of arcs and like when I was doing the drainage ditch uh, last weekend down through there a lot of those places I'd have to scrape right down to the bottom of the ditch and I'd be in a full turn and still trying to pick up material down towards the bottom end and trying not to get on the grassy part of the hay field and mash down any more hay than was possible. And if I tried to pull in a turn while trying to fill the bowl of that tumble bug, it would actually skid the back end of my H sideways and turning was almost impossible, especially when I had uh, you know, pretty much the scraper filled up with material behind the tractor. So I started unpinning the drawbar, and honestly, it was after I read that little article, and I couldn't believe how much easier that thing would turn and pull in the corners. And the same thing goes for like pulling a disc with that tractor. I love having that drawbar to swing. It's easier to handle. It maneuvers a lot easier. The tractor doesn't work as hard. I'm not putting as much wear and tear on the drivetrain, on the tires, and you can actually turn a tighter radius too than you can with that pivot point centered up on that drawbar. So. You know, that's why I let that thing swing. It's uh, it's just all around easier for the operator. It's easier for the machine. Um, it's, it's just how they work. So final talking point, and I'll finally let you guys go. Um, probably six or seven people in the comments section also wondered why I wasn't using a dozer to do that ditching work and that dirt moving and why I was using a tractor with the scraper. Um, I want to go to Doug McLean's comment. He said, yes, a tumble bug slash box scraper behind a two to three bottom tractor can sometimes outproduce a small dozer into longer pushes due to faster cycle times and cheaper to operate to boot. Doug, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, 
you know, I can use a dozer out there like my D2 and I've mentioned this several times before. D2s were never really designed to be dozing machines. They are primarily designed to be drawbar tractors and really they kind of don't even really deserve to have a blade on them. Um, they're so short, they're very unstable, they like to pitch and uh, I mean they'll leave whoops. It's If you're actually going to like try to like cut and strip topsoil with them, I know with mine, I pretty much can't. They'll actually tend to want to dig so aggressively that the blade will dive into the ground and you basically don't have the horsepower, you don't have the traction to sustain that aggressive of a bite. So your next step would be to try and raise the blade. Well now your blade is up, you're almost out of the ground. You can move forward again but now your tracks are riding up on that incline, pulls your blade further out of the ground. So now you're trying to counteract and dive the blade back in and that's how you get those those undulating whoops that are they're really hard to avoid with a small tractor like a Caterpillar D2. Um, honestly, I do like all of my stripping with the backhoe, <clears throat> excuse me, because I can do a much faster and cleaner job with the backhoe with that thumb. I can rip pieces of that, you know, thick sod bound grass, that heavy sod. They're like three times the size of the bucket in one scoop. And I can strip a lot of topsoil fast with that backhoe. That is where the D2 starts to shine. Once I have those already pre-loosened piles of topsoil on top of the ground, primarily the unbroken ground, not the stuff I've stripped yet, I can take the D2 in and move those things in mass. When you see me rolling a full blade of material in front of that D2, That's because I'm working in that already pre-loosened material and I'm not actually digging it and stripping it at the same time. And I'm just kind of pushing it along the unbroken ground, which is kind of a hard cap where if I keep just the right amount of down pressure on the blade, I'm not digging and biting. I am moving that loose material across the top of that surface. And that's where the D2 is most efficient in pushing is when I'm doing stuff like that. And that's because I've created the conditions to make it the most conducive to its capabilities, which a D2 is a very limited capability machine when it comes to dozing work. Like I said, they're primarily, well, they were designed to be drawbar tractors and there just happened to be enough of a demand out there to put a blade on those. The Caterpillar said, well, enough of all these aftermarket manufacturers making these blades, we're gonna make our own and we're gonna get part of that market share. But as far as being a really good dozing machine, a D2 just isn't. So. Another thing about using the tumble bug in the H, that is the most efficient means I have of moving dirt a distance of more than 20 feet. Okay, if it's a real short push, the D2 is fine. But if I'm going 100 feet, 300 feet, 500 feet, when you're pushing with that cat, you're continually losing material out each side of the blade and sometimes beneath the blade. And the further you go, the less of it you'll have when you get to your end destination. Um, that scraper, that little tumble bug behind the H, it allows me to load the material, carry the material, and pretty much have all of it where I want it to be when I get to the end destination, drop it there. And then I can usually, if I'm gonna load that thing up pretty heavy, I'll be in a first gear pull with the H. If I'm just gonna do a shallow cut, I can do second gear easy, but I'll usually pop it into fourth and go on back, make the return trip at a bit higher speed, pop it down into a lower gear, load my next bowl full, and then go and dump it and just repeat, repeat, repeat. And to do any kind of distance like that, granted the D2 is more fuel efficient, but the H is faster. And I would rather wear rubber tires out, which are easily replaceable and cheap when compared to steel undercarriage parts, than I would wearing undercarriage doing all of those cycles on a D2. Now, you can barely find those undercarriage parts for these vintage cats anymore, but I don't care if you're working on something antique or something modern, Undercarriage is your most expensive item generally with a crawler type tractor. And that's kind of why they got away from pulling scrapers with craw crawler type tractors decades ago and they went to rubber tired and now they're doing a lot of rubber tracked equipment now because they can get the same reduced ground pressure, but it's most times more economical to wear out rubber than it is to wear out steel undercarriage. So at the end of the day, the H does it faster the H might burn a little more fuel, but it does it more efficiently. It's a cleaner job, and for me, it's a more accurate job. Like I said, grading and cutting a grade with a D2, 
I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying I can't do it. So, you know, I've made the D2 look like it can really perform a few times, but like I said, that's because using the equipment I have to the best of its strengths, I'm kind of creating a situation that's most conducive to making that thing really pay and really work. And for moving material, I can't beat the H and the tumble bug. For me, it is, it's the absolute best way to do it, so. All right, I think that pretty much covers everything or most things I want to talk about. Um, I think I've yammered on for probably 20 minutes again. I swear I do that every time. 10 minute video always turns into 20, but uh, it's a good point to uh, end the day. I'm tired, I'm dirty, and I'm hungry. So I need to remedy all those things. Thanks for watching everybody. Please tune in again.